Uh, welcome and, uh, and thank you for, for joining our new guest speaker, guest speaker series, sorry, uh, Extra Time. Um, the Extra Time programme is going to be a guest, a guest speaker series over a, a, a monthly period where we're going to have um, sporting professionals, coaches, uh, sporting industry professionals and uh, ex-players, players and so on and so forth. So tonight uh, we've got Danny Harrison, which uh, I'm grateful and I'm sure you're going to enjoy his story. Um, Danny is, is, is a part of our programme. He's a tutor at the Stephen Jarrett Academy. But I'm going to give uh, Danny the opportunity to tell you his story and what he's, uh, what he's done. And, uh, and I'll leave it over to you, Danny, if that's OK. Yeah, fine. So, firstly, uh, thanks for inviting me on and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Danny Harrison. Uh, my current role is um, Curriculum Manager at the Stephen Gerrard Academy. Prior to that, I've been fortunate enough to play professional football for a number of years for a number of clubs. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you my story, my ups and downs, things I've learned along the way, people I've worked with, and how I've got to the position I'm, I'm, I'm currently at. Perfect, Danny. So I've, uh, I've obviously put on your, your presentation here. Um, so obviously tell the guys of, of where you started uh, as a young boy uh, and, and kind of how you went on to, to go and do the great things that you did. So yeah, if you just move that on just one more for us, Chris, please. Yeah, not a problem. So my, um, my sort of footballing journey started a little bit before what you see in front of you on the screen at the minute um, I was played gr local grassroots football as kind of everyone everyone starts with uh, I managed to play for Wirral School Boys which is which is which is sort of the area that I'm from um, I'm from there I was scouted for Everton um, I was at Everton for a couple of years under under 11 all the way to through under to under 13s um, things didn't work out well for me, so a, a common thread with all professional footballers is a, a series of setbacks, and it's kind of probably how you bounce back from, from those types of things. Um, I went back and played, I think it was probably about six, six months again, grassroots football, and got um, scouted by Tramia, and that's where my, my journey started with Tramia Rovers. Um, played all the way through up until uh, under 16 age, which... By that time, the club was making a decision on you. Um, it's changed a little bit slightly now. It's called the, like the scholarship scheme, but back then it was it was an old old school like youth trainee ship YTS scheme. Really lucky enough to be offered one of them, um, and that was kind of my my first my first step in my career, if you like. Um, I, I think subconsciously I, I've always set targets for myself whether they've been wrote down or just something that I've kind of felt I needed to do. So that, that was kind of my first step on the ladder, if you like. Um, they, they were probably, with, with the group of people that I was working with alongside the players that I was working with, those, those early years were, were easily the, the best, most enjoyable years of, of like the start of your football career. You're immersed in a, you're immersed in a culture and, a setting that you've wanted and you strive for for all your life. Um, operating with professional footballers day in, day out. Again, slightly different back then. It was things like cleaning football boots, pump, uh, pumping up balls, um, being cannon fodder sometimes for the first team, whether that be set pieces on a Friday afternoon, they throw you in the wall and take countless free kicks against you, that, that, those types of things. But even then, that it was something that I'd, I'd dreamed of something that I fully threw myself into. Um, as I was getting through sort of first year, second year of, of my of my YTS, things became apparent that I was doing well. I was, I was um, playing for the reserve teams, um, getting, being like training within the, within the first team environment quite a lot. Um, and then I was lucky enough to earn my first professional contract. Um, again, I'm a, a massive, a massive achievement and, and, and another goal that I was obviously aiming for along the way. Um, Dave Watson was the was the manager at the time, the former Everton uh, captain centre half. Um, he, he awarded me my me, me, me first professional contract. Um, and shortly after that, due to I'd like to think it was my sort of playing ability and things that I'd been doing kind of 
on, on the training ground in games. But truth be known, it's probably a lot of suspensions and a lot of injuries at the time because they were in League One. They were still a very, very well thought of club. Um, but managed to make me debut at home to Wigan Athletic. Um, I think it was in in 2000, maybe. Um, again, fantastic, fantastic op- um, time in, in my career. First team debut, everyone says they remember it. I can remember every pass, every tackle, everything I did. Lost 2-1 on a night, but um, again, it was, a, it, was a, it was another highlight. It was something that I'd strive to do, something that every sort of every young boy perhaps dreams of and I'd managed to achieve it at, at 18 so re- really proud of, again of that time I had a lot of a lot of great times at Tramia um, obviously things like first senior goal I remember it did the Alan Shearer celebration one arm up wheeled off to, to the crowd all that didn't really know what to do should have probably combined a little somersault badge kiss whatever it was but that, that was all I had in my me, in me locker at the, at the, at the time um, we also had a fantastic FA Cup run um, that year. That was under Brian Little. Um, we got to the FA Cup quarter final. That was actually a replay at Prenton Park. Um, we played Millwall. That was the year that Millwall went on to actually get into the FA Cup final. Um, we felt we had a fantastic opportunity on the night. It, it just didn't work. Um, a certain young Tim Cale um, basically bullied me around Prenton Park for 90 minutes on that night taught me a lesson about how to play centre midfield, box to box, fantastic early, scored a, scored a goal on the night. So I think you take all these sort of knocks and try and put a positive spin on it. So playing against someone like him who went on to play at the top level, fantastic learning care for me at the time. Um, best manager that I worked with whilst I, whilst I was at Trammy was Brian Little. So Brian Little obviously had a... a, a um, a fantastic mm-hmm. managerial career. The highlight of that for him would have been managing in the Premier League with Aston Villa. Um, I believe he mellowed a little bit by the time he got to Tramia. I think he was known for throwing maybe the odd teacup and, and, and losing the plot in the changing room. But for me, he was a fantastic man manager. Um, I got a, I learned a lot from him. Um, he was very structured. Um, we did a lot of 11 v 11 stuff. Um, but that was the that was the best time of my career at Tramere. I managed to win win Young Player of the Year. Played alongside some fantastic players in there. Learned a lot of stuff along the way. Um, and again, I, I thoroughly enjoyed playing for for my boy old club that had been had watched from a young age. Um, again, what what tends to happen in professional football, although things like this tend to come to an end. Um, Ronnie Moore came in. Ronnie Moore came in charge, and um, that was my la- like sort of the, the last year of my my Tramia career at that time. Um, and it was just I'd gone from playing quite regularly, even as a young player, to not not really playing. R- Ronnie brought a lot of older lads in at the time, and um, without I felt fully fully watching me or fully seeing me. Um, and then it came to the end of the season and the. the the waiting outside his room, asking to be came in, to, to sort of telling you that that you were no longer required and you'd be no longer getting a contract. Um, it was doubly doubly difficult at the time. My wife was expecting um, our first child. It was a really uncertain time, um, and that was kind of how my my Tramia, uh, Tramia career w- was going to finish for the in in the first part anyway. Um, so they were they were kind of the highlights for me in my Tramia career. Played them lots lots of really good managers, lots of really good players. Thoroughly enjoyed it and, and wouldn't change kind of anything that, that happened there. Obviously, apart from leaving. <laughs> um, Danny, but, uh, go on. Sorry, I, I was just going to ask a couple of questions on 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 that part of your journey. So, you know, going through the youth team, how many players whilst you were in the youth team made it to the grade of a professional footballer? Yeah, at, at that time, Tramia are quite well uh, sort of renowned. Um, perhaps not as much recently, but at that time, we were producing a lot of a lot of players that went on to play in the first team. Um, just off the top of my head, uh, you had people like Ryan Taylor, who went on to play for Newcastle. Uh, Aaron Cresswell, who's currently at West Ham, um, still, still, still flying there. You had people like Jason Kumas, who went on to represent Wales, West Brom. Um, 
there's quite a few to mention that, that have gone on at that time to play first team football. Um, don't get me wrong, some maybe made debuts and it didn't quite work out and stay at professional level for, for that long. Um, I think Tramia had a history back then. There was there was people in charge, of, um, a guy called Warwick Rimmer um, and John McMahon, so that, that's Steve's brother. Both both of those coaches I work with from a young age and I, and I I sort of give them a lot of credit for where I and perhaps, perhaps a lot of other of those, another number of those lads got to due to the fact that they, they were involved with within Tramir at that time with those coaches. And, and obviously, you know, going to the, the, the back end of, of your time at Tramir for the first time, was what's uh, what was it like? I mean, did you have an agent at the time? Was 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 there other clubs that you felt that you could go to, or was there someone uh, supporting you through that that time? Yeah, I did. I, I did have an agent. Um, the, the the way the agent part came about for me that it was it, it was basically um, it, it was a guy called Peter McIntosh in the first instance, but Dave Lockwood. Uh, they work for quite a big company called Stella, and I just had a really good relationship with Dave. Um, he would never actually worked on my behalf, and as it was coming to the end, uh, the, the writing was on the wall a little bit, so I did ask him to put the feelers out. Now, Dave had a lot of high-profile um, names at the time, um, a lot of like Liverpool lads, Man City lads, um, and Dave never never took a penny off me. Um, it was probably due to the fact that he wasn't actually going to make a great deal on me, um, but also he, he was he, he he knew what I brought to the table, and he was happy to do those those bits of phone and round. And towards the end of that Tramia period, uh, there was a, there was quite a few clubs um, sniffing around at the time. Um, I know there was a few Scottish Prem teams that were looking. Um, and what what ended up happening was the assistant at Tramia left during the the back end of the, the, my last season there. And went to Rotherham United, um, and that was basically how the move came about. Uh, there was nothing else concrete, and uh, uh, his name was John Brecken. He um, got in touch with me quite early on, um, invited me down, and met the manager. The manager at the time was Mark Robbins. Obviously, Mark still operating at a decent level. He, he went on to man, uh, manage Barnsley and Coventry, which is where I think he's had a couple of spells there. I think he's back there now. But went down, met met Robbo, met. Met Brex again. Obviously, I had a I had a good relationship with John, even when he was Ronnie's assistant. Sometimes you find assistants can very much go with the manager. Um, Breck was really good at being that bridge from first team um, into like lads that wasn't that, that weren't playing. So we always got on well with him. Um, and then when the opportunity came around to go and have that chat and have a look round, went down with with, with my wife. We would obviously, as I say, she she was heavily pregnant at that time. Went and had a look round. They and they at the time had been bouncing in sort of in between the championship and, and league one level. And they were actually in league two at the time. Um, but at that moment in my career, I'd, I'd probably had one season where I'd been a regular. And one of the things that Mark, as much as you can offer first team football at that, at, at that sort of time, basically guaranteed me that I'd be playing a lot of football. Which at which at any stage in a young player's career is vital. Um, I don't think um, going in for a couple of games and coming back out and and that type of scenario helps. I think you need a run of ten games. You're still learning your trade. I'm still hanging on for dear life playing at Connors Key. But there's something in games that you will always take at whatever whatever level, whether that be coaching, whether that be teaching. There's always learning and room for improvement. Um, and what age obviously then you moved to, to Rotherham what age was that then yeah, so 25 I moved there so again that, that was a it was a fairly big upheaval because I had not um, I've obviously not moved out the area um, I mean we just bought our first house and we were married and um, so again that was a, that was a that was a big step at that time um, but looking back it was the best thing that I and, and we ever did I, I played some of my best football at Rotherham and I was choking off sort of as you can see there I, I, I played a lot of games in quite a short space of time I was choking off 30, 40, 50 games a season um, and for me even Scott had a good a really good goal scoring season for a, a, still a box to box midfielder 
I think I've got six or seven one season, which for me was a, was a decent return um, for the type of player that I was. Um, we had, again, really unlucky not to move out of League Two at my, with my time there. We, we managed to get to a League Two playoff final. We played um, Dagenham and Red, Redbridge, who we'd actually beat twice in the league. Going into the game, double confident, really, really fancied our chances. Um, and it didn't work for it didn't happen for us on the day. Um, it was a listen. It was a fantastic experience. Both kids were born by them. My dad, who was a huge influence on my career, um, came down with the whole family. They watched. So again, a really good uh, sort of massive highlight. But I think what what happened at Rotherham with me was I I sort of finally tuned the type of player that I that I was. I understood what I brought to a team. Managers did the same, um, and as I say, I chalked up an awful lot of an awful lot of games there, and had some fantastic experience. And, and as I say, probably played some of the, the best football of, of my career there. Um, yeah, I mean, at twenty at twenty five, going into there, and obviously for the period that you were out there, you, you get into that point where you're you're hitting your prime. Uh, and and I, I always say this to to, to players. But you're hitting your prime at what, say, 27, 28, 29, you know, because they're probably the fittest you've ever been. You're yeah. the most experienced you've ever been. You've played. You know, was probably a reason why, again, you were you were hitting the heights of the performances. Yeah, I, I think going back to sort of right, sort of those targets that I was speaking about. I think there was certain things at the start of like each season that I always had to kind of tick off in my head to get me where I needed to be. So. My game was box to box, so I always had to like go in first day of pre-season and win like the blue test, for instance. That was my thing. I knew that I I I had to work at my game, but if I could get myself to be the fittest in the team and show the manager that that that's one of the aspects that I brought to the table, that was that was a, that was a massive thing for me. Um, and then you obviously you, you get in the team, you, you do your job, you hope you, you hope the lads around you. Sort of like help you out. They they pull their weight. Um, and again, it, it I played with some lads there that went on to do some really good things. Um, Adam Lafondre, he went on to play for sort of, um, he went on to play for Red and had a really good career. Lewis Graben is is operated in the Premier League. He was at, um, Bournemouth. I think he's still playing at Notts Forest, doing really well there. Um. I think one of the other things. Sorry, I know you've you've moved on there, but no, uh, no, it's all right. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Moore, let me go with Tramia, and we've had a guest speaker series at the college, and Kevin Ellison came on and tells a funny story that Mark Robbins left the club, and um, obviously we were on the search for a new manager, and we we got wins. So Kev had also Kevin Ellison had also been let go by Ronnie Moore at Tramia the same year as me. Mm -hmm. Um, and we got win. Ronnie was a previous rather than manager, done really well, got them into the championship. We got win that he might be coming uh, to Rotherham, so we were obviously fearful for our places. And the, there's a story we were sat in the boardroom, the door flung open, um, and in walks Ronnie, having 18 months prior, let me, Kev, and it was actually a centre half called Ian Sharps who came through Tammy, he'd let the three of us go. And he just started laughing and because he's seen the look on our faces and sort of said, don't worry, lads. It's, it, even Kale playing field, like blank sheets, all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it was um, it, it was probably not what we what we needed at the time. But in all fairness, Ronnie did. He did. He, he kept to his word. He, he gave us all a fair crack of the whip. And at that time, we all we all played a great number of games for him. So fantastic times at, at Rotherham for you then. Yeah, really good. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Still, still speak to the manager currently, Paul Warren. He was a he was a member of the squad at the time. Um, I've got nothing but sort of sort, sort of fond memories. Again, the the downside with with a footballing career, it, it comes to an end some at some stage. And um, Steve Evans came in. Um, my last year, I was captain. So that faulty on the, the far right there. Um, I was captain for about 20 games that season. I think I, I racked up something like 50 appearances with cup games and all the rest of it. Steve Evans came in after Andy Scott got the sack. And I think he was manager for, for probably three or four weeks before the end of the season. It was a really late sacking in the season. 
um, and he pulled me in. And again, I, I, w- I was a bit unsure about where it would, was going with him. I couldn't really read him as a manager. Um, and again, he, he thanked me for my time and said, um, if you need me to contact any managers for you, I would. Um, but we will know how long we won't be offering you the contract. Um, so again, really sort of upset and frustrating times. The, the life of a footballer, uh, massive highs and lows. Um, but I think going into sort of the next bit, speaking about my time at Chester, you have to have um, a degree of resilience and a degree of mental sort of mental strength. And, and I was really lucky that I had a fantastic sort of a fantastic family unit. I had a, um, my dad was a was a massive influence on my career. I always had a way of kind of turning something around for me and having a positive outlook on whatever time, whether it was playing, not playing, doing well, not doing well. Um, so again, it it, it, it it sort of it, it gave me a good grounding to to deal with some of the setbacks. I mean before. We haven't got it in, but I actually went back to Tramia for another year prior to going to Chester. Um, in hindsight, that was probably, I wanted to get back home and I was really keen. Ronnie again had left Tramia, by, uh, sorry, left Rotherham by that point, went back to Tramia, signed me for a year. And I think he signed me to basically be um, kind of a squad player. I'd gone from playing a lot of games, expecting to start, got myself in really good condition as I always try to um, and he brought a lot of loan players in. They were very good loan players by the way but um, I still thought that I, I could match them. Um, ben Gibson he brought in, he went and played for, um, he's playing for Middlesbrough and Norwich City at the minute. A guy called Liam Palmer, really good um, young player, is now playing for Scotland and Sheffield Wednesday. Um, Max Power at the time, Max was coming through at Tramia, he went, he's going, he's playing for Sunderland got Wigan into the championship so all these types of players I I think it just it was a it was me being really keen to get back home and again signing for Ronnie that I'd had a better experience than the first time but it didn't quite work out Um, so that led me to to a Chester Um, again this is this is a this time in my career was it was a total spin for me Um, I mentioned my dad before so during this time um, it was, it was easy, the difficult, the most difficult time of my life and my career. My dad passed away, unfortunately, during that time. Um, really quite sudden, was, wasn't anything that the family were prepared for. Um, so having sort of lost that, like, that focal point, that sort of, that, that, that man who gave me a lot of guidance um, was really tough. Um, I played a couple of days after he actually passed to try and sort of try and get back on, on try and get back into the swing of things. Um, I, I think I played for about a month before it really hit me. Um, and the, Neil Young, who was the manager at Chester at the time, took me out because he could see I was struggling and I needed a bit of time just to sort of get my head together, for want of a better word. Um, but then that couple, probably a couple of weeks after that, um, I cleared it. Um, a ball over my shoulder and felt a really sharp pain in my hip. Um, and then it, it transpired that I'd done quite a lot of damage inside my hip joints. Um, on the back of that, I ended up having having surgery um, to the cartilage inside my hip. And probably start to finish, I was out for roughly about a year. Um, so I, I think what I try and get across to a lot of players that I'm involved with, whether that's still playing now, Connors Key, or the young players coming through at, at the academy, anyone I've dealt with, is that you will have kind of these 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 setbacks. You will have times where your mental health is, which is very, very pertinent at the minute. There's a lot of sports people coming out, isn't there, speaking about mental health. Um, and, and I speak to a lot of people and, and sort of men as... As, as we are, don't really aren't really forthcoming in that, um, and speaking about the feelings and speaking about what's what what's inside the head. I, I've always never had a problem with that, and I, I don't mind speaking about it now. I I didn't have mental health struggles, and and, and people have far worse things than than I've ever had going on, but I just had a really good support network that managed to assist me during that time. 
and I was able to speak to people. I'm really close to, to my brother, for instance. I've got a really good group of mates. Um, I've got a, got a fantastic family, wife, who I can speak to, and that's never been a problem. Um, but yeah, that was a really, diff really, really difficult part of my career. And again, it, it's a different sort of mental health, uh, mental challenge and resilience coming back from perhaps being in and out of a team to being told that you might not get back, you might not play again. Um, and I think during this time, I will, we'll speak about it a bit later on, is where I, where I firmly understood the importance of making sure that my next steps were taken care of. So what I mean by that, um, I'd love to be sat here saying I was a multi-millionaire as some of the guys are, obviously you're playing it a lot higher than me, but I always knew that I would never have that re retirement money, if you like. I always knew I'd have to work again. Um, I had I had passions growing up. One was football, but I did actually always enjoy school. Um, I always enjoyed education. Both my parents were teachers, so I had that background growing up. Uh, they always drum, uh, used to drum it into me the importance of, of education. Um, so I, it was at probably this time where speaking with a lot of physios at the time and coaches and people like that, they were encouraging me to to further my education. So whilst the trauma first time round when I was younger I completed the BTEC level three um which which gave me enough sort of UCAS points to get access to university. So during this time I was on my first year of my degree at John Moore's. So again I, I knew I had to put some building blocks in place and something I was obviously um passionate about was was my football and the sports science aspect. So that kind of this time gave me perhaps a little bit of a jolt to make to sort of say, well, what are we going to do at the end of this journey? I, hopefully it was going to continue, but just in case it doesn't, what have, we, what have I got planned? What have I got in the locker moving forward? And what, what age was you at when you started your, your degree level? So I actually started at probably the last year at Rotherham, so I was 29 at that point. Um, and I'd, I'd seen by then, actually, I'd seen probably quite a lot of lads fall out of the professional football at probably early 30s. So even though I was feeling good, even though I was playing okay, um, it was like I perhaps got two or three years here back like at the professional level before I need to make a decision about what I'm going to do. Um, I actually started an online degree with, with the PFA that they put you in, in touch with, which was distance learning. Um, it, 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 it didn't work for me at that time, which is why I then um, changed it over to John Moores, which is a science and football degree. So I just felt a lot more comfy that it was the sports science approach. But in football, obviously, there was there was kind of two things that I loved there and I had a passion for, and they just merged together and worked for me. And, and, and could you um, could you relate or relate to, obviously, your playing, you know, playing experiences, helping you with your academic experiences when you're going through your degree process? Yeah, 100%. It was, it was things like, as I say, dealing with a lot, this period in my career and in my life, I was dealing with a lot with um, like sports scientists and physiotherapists and, and, and people in the industry who were experts outside of coaching. I'd always, I, I'd, I'd started little bits of coaching then as well, but I didn't really know where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. But I just knew that A, I needed to do something that was perhaps going to sustain me for like years to come, I, I get another role, another career, but also I knew what I, what I loved and what and what I wanted to get into, which was football. But at kind of whatever level, I wasn't quite sure then. Um, so that that's where it was sort of at, at Chester, and those two years gave me, with not playing as well, gave me the perfect opportunity to kind of finish off my degree, and then even look for steps beyond that. Um, Chester at the time where the first year were full time, then moved to part time in my second year. So what that then gave me was the chance to get out there in, in the in the world of proper work, if you if you want to call that, um, and looking for jobs, um, which is kind of which is how my journey brought me to, to to or the start of my journey brought me to where we are currently. Yeah. So fantastic, um, and then moving from Chester, you you went to, to Connors Key. Yeah, again it. This is, it, it, and it still is. Um, I, I played a, a great number of games, n number of games for them, and I've I've only got sort of fond memories. Uh, not fond memories because I'm still going, but 
Um, every kind of experience with, with Connors Key has been fantastic for me at the minute. Um, not only have they been fully understanding with my role and my commitments in, in my current job, which, which we'll get on to, but I'm working with um, a manager who I've got no doubt will go on and manage in the league or as high as it will take him. And Andy Morrison, Andy, who's a former Manchester City centre-half, got a bit of a reputation as, as, as a bit of a like a hard man. Um, but, but, on the outside, very old school in his methods. Um, I would have loved to have played for him, perhaps in and around my Rotherham career, because I, I think that he, and I still believe he'll go on to do really, really good things. And that's not just saying that because I play for him still and all that sort of stuff. That he's, he's very meticulous. He, he's starting to be able to bridge the old school values that I still believe are really, really important with the, the way the technology's moved on. Um, he embraces the sports science stuff. So there's a number of older players there at Connors Key at the minute. He understands the training loads that the players go through. He understands the need for rest. He understands um, the video analysis side of things. He's meticulous. If there's another word for meticulous that goes on beyond that, that's what he is on things like set pieces and how we set up. Um, I've had some fantastic nights and, and, and events there. We've obviously... We've qualified for the Europa League, I think, four out of the five seasons that have been there. Um, we went over to Norway and beat a team called Stabæk 1-0. Drew 0-0 in the first leg, went over there, beat them 1-0 in the second leg. Fantastic, fantastic achievement. Then on the back of winning that, we played a team from Serbia called Vojadina um, in the most hostile environment that I've ever played in, um, just full of sort of angry middle-aged men who wanted to jump on the pitch and try and choke every single one of us. Um, we had armed guards outside the outside our changing room, outside our hotel. Um, but again, the, the, the thing that stands out for me for my time here, I, I've played a number of games in the Football League as, as a professional, but without going to Connors Key, I wouldn't have had some of these, these fantastic European adventures which has obviously culminated in, in uh, something that perhaps I never thought I'd get to, which I can say I played in the Champions League. Um, we, we were lucky, I wouldn't say lucky enough, we deservedly, we were awarded the league last year. We were top when COVID kind of hit the, the football scene in Wales um, by, I think it was four points with not many games to play. Um, we were rightly awarded the league, the title, um, and from there, obviously, you, you qualify to play in the Champions League. Um, we played the team called FJ Sar uh, FK Sarajevo. Pro uh, uh, sorry, uh, we played that at uh, Cardiff City Cardiff City Stadium. So just to, as I'm reeling and off now, it, it, it it was a long time ago, but it's just a fantastic fantastic achievement and a fantastic achievement for not only myself but all the lads that that have either played like non-league or lower league, to say that the Champions League players all played in that environment, it was, was fantastic for all of us. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, obviously, we were we were massively uh, proud of you playing in the Champions League this season, obviously getting that winner's, winner's trophy from, from last season, which is fully deserved. Um, and obviously, hopefully, there's, there's more to come through Connors Key and yourself. Uh, but obviously, moving on to kind of your education story. Uh, I, mean, I know you mentioned about John Moore's um, and, and obviously you can go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, um, so yeah, I, I, as I say, the, the, the degree um, kind of was perfect for me. It was just, it, it was as if it was made for me, if you like. It, it was, I was able to apply my knowledge and, and sort of experience that, I, that I'd had in the professional game, um, but also learning disciplines around like the sports science, the strength and conditioning. And a big one for me was the psycho psychology side of things. Um, it's becoming ever more prevalent at the minute with obviously some of the issues that I was talking about previously around mental health. Um, I did my dissertation around um, support structures for retiring players in football um, at whatever age it was because it, it, was, it was something that really interested me. Um, a duty of care that clubs, for me, perhaps don't have and should really put in place, whether that's of a, for a player of my age who's looking to plan for the future of his family, or you, you look at the academy player that's been 
at a high a high profile club from the age of 10 gets to the age of 18 and the club sort of say thanks but no thanks they, they i've seen a number of players who've come on loan to all the clubs that i've played for having um and, and sort of been been shattered by being let go by their their boyhood club being promised the world and then not a lot of duty of care um sort of for their next steps or their welfare and things so again that that was just a just a part that really that i really enjoyed um on the back of that i, I was still able to coach so i went into trammy rovers academy which was which they helped me um achieve my b license um and then also as, as i alluded before both my parents were teachers so it was something that really really struck home for me that i enjoyed it um how I started my journey at the, the Stephen Gerrard Academy, I, I came in on a voluntary basis, helping out on the maths and English side. Um, just I've heard a lot of good things about about how we how they operated with the football program, with the education program, and I just thought that married up that married up a lot of the things that I needed at the time. Um, I did a bit of volunteering, um, maths and English. Went through my PGC, which were, and at the time I was a tutor coach. So what that meant was I was doing a, a teacher's job as well as being on the, the pitch in the afternoon. And again, I've had a fantastic time. I've loved every minute. Um, I'm really proud to say I'm part of the organisation. I really believe that, that, that we're going to go on to, to bigger and better things. We've had some fantastic occasions winning the Dallas Cup. Uh, going over there, being involved with that team, the whole the whole group that was over there, not just not just myself and uh, John McGrattan who were involved in the team, but but Todd and Dave, the whole group that were out of the out there at the time played a massive part. And now my, my current role is is curriculum manager, so I liaise sort of I liaise with Todd, who's the head of football a lot, and and mm-hmm. how it all joins into place. Really, really excited by the, the recent collaboration with with LLS. Meeting a lot of really, really good people, learning a lot of a, a lot of stuff off off guys that have been in education a lot longer than me, helping me massively in my role. And I, I think that the common thread for me, whether it be football, whether it be education, whether it be teaching or uh, curriculum manager in my role, is, is that constant sort of drive the constant willingness to learn, take feedback, take criticism, whatever it may be, because mm-hmm. you've just got to tap into all these people that are around you. Oh, it's, it's perfect. And, and, and obviously, you know, the, the programmes that we offer with, with the internationals as well. And, you know, do you believe that having those players develop us as, as, a, as an academy and also for the players, do you think that they develop uh, because of the experiences coming to England? Yeah, hundred oh, percent. I think I was saying to you before, Chris. I think the environment that we that we're, we're looking to create is everything that I've experienced as a young professional footballer. So we you we you get to work with you get to work with top coaches. You get you get access to the best facilities, much better than when even I was playing. You get access to high quality education. Um, we're looking to develop the, the, these young these young people as players as 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 players as students for people got for when they go out into the big wide world we, we want to signpost them to the best version of whatever they can be whether that's on the pitch or whether that's in the classroom that's quite a spot on and obviously with with Stephen being heavily involved uh, obviously due to, to covid he's not obviously been down um but you've been able to go go up to Rangers uh, on a CPD day. Tell yeah, a little bit about that. Yeah, fan, fantastic. I, I think the the thing that everyone that needs to be like mindful of is that this isn't just in name. Say Stephen being like the Stephen Gerrard Academy, he's got a massive say and has a massive input in what we do, and he's very very sort of hands on and, and really wants to know everything that's going on with with our players, with our staff, and. Um, yeah, last year he, inv- he invited us up to Rangers. Um, never had the opportunity to play against Stephen, uh, other than we had a little game in the academy, and it's probably a good job really because it's not something I look back fondly on running around after him for whatever it was an hour. It was probably the, easily the toughest hour of my life. So to get him in his prime is something that I didn't want any involvement in. But um, yeah, he invited us, us us up as a staff. Um, 
we had a good look around the, the facility. We had lunch with him, his staff. Uh, we were able to watch a training session, which was, I think it was two days before they had the European fixture. So it was a lot of team play. It was a lot of sort of how they were going to set up. Um, and again, I'd seen a lot of sessions in my time, but a guy called uh, McBeal works closely with Stephen up there. And I think LLS may have had him on as a, as a guest speaker in the past as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he doesn't need me to tell him that, that, that he was impressive in what he was doing. He's obviously a, a, a top, top coach. Um, it was a fantastic session. Um, and then we were, the, the lads that were playing went in and then we were able to stay out and watch sort of a bit of, a, perhaps more of a conditioning session for the lads that were either on the fringes or coming back. Um, and again, the tempo and the drive of the whole sort of, the whole squad and the whole feel and the culture that he's, that he's, that he's looking to get up there, Stephen, was was a game where you could feel that as you as you walked in through the door. Um, then Stephen gave a, gave a presentation on kind of his ethos, it, the way that he liked things done, what he was looking to, his blueprint for, for success up there, what he was looking to do, how he was looking to get the players on board. And, and I think if you fast forward to where we are now, looking at how well they're doing currently, both domestically and, and on the European scene, I don't think it's any doubt that he's destined for for bigger and better things as a manager. But um, the level at which, which like myself and all the rest of the staff were impressed by him was 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 where he was where I wanted it to be. Having watched him as a sort of as a fan um, and all the things that he did play wise, I was I was I was more than impressed with what he was doing as a as a as a manager and what he was trying to do. Perfect. Well, I think it'd be a right time to uh, to open it up to the floor uh, for anyone who, who would like to ask any questions. Um, you can write in the chat, uh, and Mike will uh, will ask the questions uh, to Danny. So, if there's anyone who's interested in, in asking uh, Danny a question, then just write in the uh, the chat of, on, on this for us. Um, but we'll continue to keep speaking, uh, Danny, as as the the, the, um, the obviously questions come in. Um, Looking back at your career from a from a full time you know athlete, uh, what was the differences between our our academy at Stephen Gerrard uh, with with obviously you being a pro and, and going through those was it was a much difference at all? Um, um the, the, this isn't something that that, that I'm, I'm just saying because we're on here having this chat. The way that the the sports science and things have, have kind of came on in recent times and what we offer sort of at the academy at the minute, um. It, it's a better it's a better environment to be playing in. Um, we we do we use the, the player tech software. We use the huddle software. I've I've been a massive advocate of if a young player can watch themselves back, not only have a sort of preconceived view of how they think they've done in the game, but actually like a hard copy. Watch yourself back for that ninety minute period. That is the one of the best learning tools that you can that you can get for me. And for all our students at the college to have that facility straight after they've played, perhaps the, the following morning to go back and watch the performance while it's fresh in the head is something that I was never privy to as a, as a professional footballer. Um, that's to do with technology moving on, but that's just to show, that's to say how innovative we are as a staff, that, that, that that's on offer for our students. Perfect. And, and also, you know, looking at the different coaches that we have, uh, a lot of the coaches have, have lived and played overseas as well. So, again, you know, for those international students coming over, um, do you think, again, having that, that aspect of, of even for yourself, moving away from your family, moving away from your home environment, do you think that really helps and progress your career? Uh, that's one part of the question. And also, on a second part is, because of your life experiences and because of what you've done in the professional game, do you believe that's enhanced your coaching ability and, and teaching? Yeah, 100%. So in answer to the first question, the, the moving away side of things from my home, from from sort of the area where I grew up with, the grew up in, sorry, um, that what that gives you is that that gives you sort of that that extra little bit of drive and that extra bit of sort of will to succeed. So taking those steps to take yourself out of perhaps that comfort zone that you've got and testing yourself whether that be on the football pitch, whether that be in the, in the classroom, that they're the things that will further down the line you'll fully see the benefits of being able to operate where it's not, it's no, I, I don't think there's any point in just feeling comfy in things, whether that's 
life, football, coaching, whatever it is, you need to feel um, sort of stretched and you're challenged. And they're the, they're the times when you step up to the plate and, 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 and sort of you achieve more, I think, and learn more about yourself. So putting yourself in that position, wanting to learn, wanting to come out of your comfort zone is a, is a massive thing and, and will help all, all the students that are looking to, to get involved with our programme. Um, sorry, what was the, the second part of sorry. it? Yeah, the, the second part was you're obviously, uh, with your experiences, moving away from home, do you think that, that has made you a better coach or, or a better person to talk to or just more yeah. knowledge? Yeah, um, so I think all the experiences, so not just me, um, you, you've got a range of coaches sort of at the academy. Now, what, what they bring is untold in terms of the experiences that they've had as players, as coaches in different environments, in different countries, working with different perhaps managers above them, watching different coaches. If, if you kind of, if you were to put all this into sort of like, I don't know, just the way we bring all these kind of experiences and expertise in, in, together, I do, I, I, I've, and I've said this for a long time, our staff will hold up, hold their own against anyone that we, we kind of put them in front of on the football and coaching coaching aspect and even bring in people like Andy Marshall who's our sort of uh, analyst at the minute some of the stuff that he does in and around huddle in and around the, the player tech the feedback that we get off that um, it's just a, a fantastic holistic all round approach to the, to, to the football and the education Perfect Mike uh, we have a couple of questions through is that right? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that sort of, um, they all ask a similar sort of approach. So what I'll do is I'll ask you, I'll make you three statements and questions here. And if they all sort of roll in together. So if you want to try and answer them together, if possible. So first of all, we've got a statement that you, we want to see if you sort of agree with it. So the program seems to be a holistic approach, a well, well-rounded in producing potential elite players and preparing them for off the field lifestyle as well. Uh, whether you sort of you agree with that as a statement, so it's not just uh, not just focusing on the football, but for well-rounded uh, development of players. Yeah, um, so yeah, I fully fully agree with that. I, I think that perhaps one of the reasons that that my story kind of links into what to what we're speaking about is that I have been lucky enough to be a professional footballer, but I've always found that having that underpinning knowledge, having that ability to be able to um, apply what you've learned in a different industry, being able to get qualified in something that you love, whether it be sport, teaching, um, for later on in your career and life, ultimately will, will, will help you moving forward. Excellent. So I've also got some here about the, the programme itself. So um, this will probably feed into it, but could you give us an idea of a typical week uh, for the players at the academy? But also, can you say how you feel that your time and your story as a professional player um, is fed? Uh, and obviously, the, the the experience that comes from Stephen and his and his career as well is fed into the academy to influence those student players. Yeah, so I, I think from I mean I'm not ever going to sit here and compare myself to, to Stephen's career by any stretch. But one of the things that he was very, very keen on and, and a message that he really wanted to get across to our students was the importance of the education. Um, when you hear him speak um, on, on camera or being privy to the, pre, uh, the presentation that he gave up in, in Rangers in Scotland to us, he's a very, very intelligent man. He's got those experiences of playing the game. And I think what we look to do as a sort of organisation is feed those messages through that you can have fantastic playing experiences with us. You can access the best facilities. You can access the best coaches that, that we can provide, but also the best stand-up education programme that ultimately, moving forward, is going to stand you in good stead. We, we want people to progress to the best levels and be the best version that they can be of themselves, whether that's whatever level of football they, they're able to achieve. We've got tremendous links in the area to obviously the Welsh League where I'm playing in, non-league, semi-pro, professional. We use all these contacts that we've got within the game to enhance the football programme. But also with our links, we're, we're all teacher university trained. Um, we, we've also got links within the university sort of circles as well. 
um, we're, we're all sort of highly motivated, highly qualified people. So, yeah, to answer your question, that, that's kind of how the messages from myself about my career and where you can go with it, and how Stephen's message is, is always is always there in the background coming coming through. Mike, is there any more? Sorry. Um, so yeah, so we've got uh, is the Stephen Gerrard Academy for both male and female players. Um, if you want to just give it a breakdown on, on what the, I think we've got the three different levels, haven't we? So we've got elite development and then the, the females. Do you want to just break that down, how it's structured in the academy? Yeah, so so we do have, yeah, we do encourage female applicants and fe female students. We have got um, a fantastic group at the minute um, in around 20 girls on programme. Now they play in the, the probably one, the best league outside of the academy system for the for the women's football. Um, we also have on role within that um, a number of the girls play actually play for Tramia Rovers ladies um, and are looking to try and make their way on the professional side of the game whilst obviously um, continuing in, in their education as well. Um, the elite level, sort of the way that we, we structure the, the playing side of stuff, so the elite level lads typically for us are the boys that haven't quite made that grade that I was talking about previously at 16, whether that's just falling short of the achieving scholarships at professional clubs. So we have boys who, who, who are coming from um, Wigan, from Rochdale, places like that, Tramia Rovers, um, who come and join us and they have an expectation of the types of things that they they require to get themselves back in, which is what we can offer them on the coaching side of stuff. All our coaches are UEFA licensed um, and what we look to do for them, we, we, we profile all our players at whatever level they, they come in at. Um, so they know sort of strengths, areas for improvement. They get all their data at the end of every game. They're able to see where they need to improve on. Um, and when we, feel, when we feel the time is right for them, we give them that access to those, some of those networks that we were talking about, with it being non-league, Welsh league, pro, um, semi-pro. And that's, that's their kind of, that's their pathway. Also alongside linking in with the USA scholarship route, which has been very, very popular with some of our students. Uh, we spoke previously about the Dallas Cup, where we, where we were lucky enough to, to be really successful in that cup. Eight students out of that uh, particular cohort have gone on to USA scholarships, had fantastic playing experiences over there. Some are still out there. Some have actually come back and now um, get paid to play football semi-pro. Um, so that's the that's the kind of pathway for our um, elite lads we have had. Um, there's a guy called Paul Mullen at the minute. He was I think up until last weekend he was top scorer across all the domestic leagues in European. I think for how many goals he scored, he's playing for Cambridge United. So that's an example of uh, a lad that's gone on and played professional football as well. Um, the other different levels that we have, we have a, um, a development. Um, strands of the college as well. So these are boys and girls that are looking to. They have a love of. They have a love of football. They enjoy playing. They, they enjoy playing football, and their their pathway is potentially harnessing the the sports science, the analyst type sort of scenario, and furthering their career that way. So they love playing football. They, they love the games program that we that we provide. But their their journey will will take them into, as I say, the performance analysis, the sports science route. Um, and we, 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 we constantly sort of make sure that that's happening for them. So then their pathway may be not the elite football route as some, some players have, but we make sure that that's integrated within their programme so they understand their next steps. Excellent. So there's still quite a few questions, but I think um, I'll hand it back over to Chris. Um, because I don't want to keep people too much longer. So uh, if you want to take it from there, Chris. Yeah, spot on, Mike. Well, um, just the, this the last question from, from me, uh, Danny, to be fair. Um, and obviously we, we can get information to, to you, Danny, because uh, we know you're training tonight as well. So you need to, to get, on that, uh, get on that road down that motorway and uh, get to training. Uh, but my last, last question is to you is what, what advice would you give to a young aspiring uh, student athlete? Uh, good, really good question. So, I think I mentioned it at the start. I I always had targets my, myself, 
um, just to give you that little bit of bit of drive and bit of structure to 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 what you to where you need to be. So I mentioned my target. One of them was always being the fittest. One of them was was making my first team debut. One of them was um, constantly playing week in week out. I wanted to be captain at one stage for the club, which and, and I think all these things, all these little targets making sure that I was able to achieve a degree um, being in a, in a managerial role it, 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 sort of where I am now within the college um, setting those small targets not necessarily wrote down but certainly like within you so you knew, you know what your, your sort of goals are but I think just being passionate Chris I think wanting to do something and following following it through and having a bit of a dream as well. I mean, I know that's a load of advice, but and, and another thing as well, working with people like yourself at LLS and, and guys on the education and, and picking up things off coaches, never thinking that you, you, you're done learning, never think that that journey stops for you either. Um, I'm 38, just turned yesterday. I'm going into training tonight, hoping that I pick something else up that I've not seen in a session for 22 years of playing professional football or semi-professional football. I think you've got to have that mindset as well. So I know that was a little bit scattergun and all over the place, but yeah, probably loads of different messages, but they're the things that kind of keep me going. Um, and, and they're the, the things that I know yourselves at LLS and us at SGA try and, try and get into all the students' athletes. Perfect. Well, I appreciate your time, Danny. And I, and I also want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, there will be more guest, uh, guest speakers coming on and, and, and it will be extra time with um, someone else in December. So uh, stay tuned to, to get involved with the link in there. Um, but like I said, Danny, appreciate your time. Uh, we wish you all the best and uh, enjoy training tonight. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.